All right, there we go. All right, so entertainment is a new modern warfare. Weapons of mass destruction no longer target the body initially, but the mind. The discipline of self-governance of one's mind agency has eroded into delegation to dopamine addiction providers. The battlefield is mind control and the vector is attention. Um, and then, yeah, the probing questions. How long has this been the case? Under what criteria has this been the case? Under which criteria does it emerge, sustain, and transform, or end? Through history, when has this criteria emerged and shown or not shown this effect? The quest for agency themes of mind control, conspiracy, and propaganda, as well as mindfulness and deliberation, are scattered throughout history in the world. What can we learn from our past and how to deal with attention threats? Yeah, so uh, I was just thinking about in terms of TikTok and like how TikTok has like infiltrated the youth. And in a large part, like the people generally act only when things become necessary for them to act. So before a hundred years ago, uh, education was exclusive to the privileged few and they were generations that cared about excellence because they could also afford to care about excellence. But then when we mass produced education, uh, it, there wasn't really a culture of excellence there. Uh, and what's happened instead, especially in the, in like probably through all the world is we no longer have a necessity to go from like surviving or comfort uh, to thriving in excellence. And to go from just comfort to thriving, uh, we need to actually want it because it isn't just like we, there's no necessity to go from comfort to thriving. Um, we actually have to have a morality to want it. So I, I, so I think this has stunted the maturation of individuals. I think there's a lot of adults who now act like children because they're not independent, capable agents. Yep. Before it's the role of parents to create children, to transform children that were dependent on the father or the mother uh, into now independent, capable agents who could actually interact, disagree, you know, I deal with conflict and know that they can transcend it. And this has uh, deteriorated. And I think, uh, especially now, uh, before, uh, like this, this is the role of propaganda now, which is how can we, like the parents aren't now propagandizing the children into, you know, what, what thing they should use. And especially as soon as a kid becomes a teenager, the parents' influence has diminished because the social competition, that's what the kids care about. Like they're at the stage where the hormones are flowing and they're caring about social competition. And that's being sucked up by TikTok, which is a Chinese one. We have Instagram, we have Netflix, which is like a Silicon Valley progressive one. Uh, and Amazon Prime have their own propaganda. Apple TV have their own. Like when I watched the Apple TV keynote, I was just thinking like, Jesus, they're going to price this at $5 a month for the family or something like that. Like it's going to be a family deal. And then that way, you know, the kids will beg the parents and now they're all consuming the Apple propaganda. Uh, and people don't realize, uh, especially like with any of the content they're consuming is they're being programmed by the content they consume. And they don't have yet a framework to discriminate between what information they, they should use to program themselves. Uh, program so sorry. right now yeah program by so i didn't catch that correctly like i i, I was thinking about something else <laughs> trying yeah, so to say for instance yeah yeah so for instance like a game uh like a video game that is a person uh abiding by the programming of the game maker and so for instance the game is playing them as much as they are playing the game now, if they're, uh, so if they're more playing the game in, in terms of a creativity aspect, they're looking for one to understand the rules of the game and then how can they exploit those rules. Um, whereas for things like Netflix, that is a routine that is being passed now in people's brains that is then causing effects within them, side effects, uh, or even targeted effects within them. So people need to know, like when you read a book, like you have to deliberate and discriminate over which, like you have to deliberate over, I'm going to select books in this category because I want this result in myself. And then you have to discriminate between the wealth. There's unlimited like wealth of information we now have. You now have to discriminate very well on what you're going to use your attention towards to program yourself and like produce outcomes within you to train and cultivate yourself. So 
it seems like giving away free education or like free entertainment to everybody is a lot more uh, a way of exploiting people's dopaminergic uh, abilities to start programming uh, the masses. You don't have to. Uh, so yeah, the, so this is pretty much it. Like if you want to uh, alter, you know, millions of people before you would run newspaper ads or, you know, <laughs> hire them or, uh, you know, have a war or whatever it is. The government was probably the only one doing the propaganda. But now the propaganda department is in companies. Uh, and they're now doing a lot because they have so much control over people's attention. Um, so they're programming people through entertainment. Okay, so <laughs> a, lot, a lot to unpack. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what... Uh, okay, so let let me let me go over. First, I I completely agree with the with the, uh, the part of what you described that what you see like um, uh, especially stuff like adults acting like children, or basically uh, entertainment or information used as a kind of weapon. On the other hand, there are a bunch of details where I don't quite agree. And I don't yeah. agree because, well, more, mostly for historical reasons. I'm, I'm not sure if you are aware of, uh, well, I'm, uh, you are probably aware of uh, Chomsky's uh, um, manufacturing consent. Uh, uh, so that's a book he wrote yeah, with another not... guy. Yeah, explain and, it. Explain it to me. Well, I haven't read the book. I just watched the movie, uh, which goes into okay. the details. But basically, that that says uh, that that talks about what you said that before that the government was doing the propaganda or basically similar situations. So, okay, let me jump back uh, a bit more. But another person I need to mention, uh, Marshall McLuhan a Canadian um, media philosopher. He said, uh, he has a book called Medium is the Message. And it's, okay. it has a typo in the, an uh, intentional typo in the title. It, it's not message, it's massage. Right. So it's just one letter, but it's complete. And in, it's an interesting um, analogy, even though, uh, even using the, the typo. And basically McLuhan says that there is hot media and cool media and hot media is that like radiates something and cool media is like book where you have to engage with it in order to consume it and right. his point was that the telephone like uh, like that was one of his uh, favorite examples it's it doesn't really matter from an uh, overall a perspective that um, what an individual talks on the phone if if you want to look at the effects of the the phone it's much easier to to, to look all all at once and how that changes and quite uh, nicely like i watched a couple of interviews with him and he quite nicely saw ahead of time like 50 years ago what will happen by now with the internet and everything else. Okay, so that, that's the two people who already were quite deep into these topics way before us. And um, so I build a lot of my ideas on what they found and a bunch of other people. And basically everything for me starts with a very simple and like a, like a meditative question. <laughs> a bit of uh, like introspection and similar stuff. Um, and that, that question is, where are words before we say them? Right. Because when, when I'm speaking and when I'm trying to express myself, it's, it's a flow. It, it, they just come, I know what I want to say, but the words, I don't decide, decide each individual word. And I believe that this, it's a cycle. So what I say is somehow driven by my thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But that thought that drive these communication need to necessarily come from some kind of practice that I practiced in my life with others, which is what I call is common talk, like people each are talking with each other. What's, what's my belief, and it, this, is, this is the part that needs validation or verification in some way, but I don't know how, is that this common talk is driven by culture and rituals. So what people talk about, how, how people approach topics in their everyday lives are driven by this bigger common thing that, like McLaren says, that the medium is the message. And for me, let me not <laughs> forget, uh, Yeah, so the the important thing uh, to realize is that everybody is alive at the same time. So whatever we talk about, we talk about at the same day, in the same 24 hours. Well, I like to put it in a bit poetically, saying that um, everybody's hearts beat at the same time. Even if you sleep, your your heart is still beating, and whoever's heart is not beating is not with us, is not influencing this uh, common talk. Mm-hmm. And the ritual and cultural talk is driven by the individual talk. So that's where the cycle closes for me. I'm not sure if this is a good way to put it. For me, it's very helpful. Right. So, so this is the cycle that um, we influence both on an individual level and on every step, like uh, the propaganda and all the other stuff. So what, what I believe in is that this goes back very far in the past. So originally everything that we knew for 50,000 years, most of the past 50,000 years was like, was not uh, propagated in, in writing. Mm. So pe- people had to memorize things and how much people could memorize was basically how much knowledge they could spread. And when the population masses like the, What's the word? Well, basically, at these uh, in these river deltas and the river valleys, uh, a lot of people, like so many people, started living all together. That writing mm-hmm. basically took uh, the role of the ancestors or old people who were giving knowledge to to the youngsters, and writing basically took over this role. Mm-hmm. About five thousand, six thousand years ago. Right. And ever since, writing has this dual role. On the one hand, what you say is this, like, even religion is a kind of um, propagandistic warfare, which is incredibly right. successful. Because yeah. everybody who can subscribe on the same religion will further the survival of their nation or like, right. wh- whoever believes in the same things. But on the other hand, the reason this works is not because just like, not, not just because of the role of violence. It's also because despite writing being this ephemeral thing that basically anything that's in writing is impossible to validate just by itself. So yeah, whatever I write, those symbols mean something for me and whoever can write it. And th- there are some like, it's, it's not just one direction. So form drives function, but also form, function drives form. But still, if, if I just write down something, that can be interpreted in any kind of way. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to say that writing still, despite of this fact, has some truths in it that gradually become um, like more important or more uh, like better expressed. The good example is obviously mathematics, but also geography and and everything that is true, not because we say it's true, like um, it's true that um, there are seven days in a week. That's Mm -hmm. 
completely arbitrary. We, we make it so and it's true, but it could be anything true. But there are truths like if I say that the, glass, uh, the grass is green, obviously you could say with different words and then it would be a different kind of expression. But the idea that it expresses is independent of the writing. So there is a detachment between what you can write and what can be true. All right. Okay, so I'm almost at the end. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. So I don't know what was before, like before 2000 years ago, because there is very little writing that remains. So we know that, for example, a bunch of things like fractional reserve rank banking and credit money and all these kinds of stuff was definitely existing even in 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia and uh, 6,000 years ago in Egypt. But there is very little otherwise. Uh -huh. in, the, in the more recent years, before the French Revolution, for almost 2,000 years, almost everywhere on earth, as far as I know it, people believed in a kind of Aristotle kind of thinking, which I like to summarize that everything has its own place. That, that even, even today, most people believe in something like this, like everything has its right place and you have to put them in their right places or they strive to be in their right places and they try to find for themselves and for others this, okay, you are like this and for you, this is the appropriate position or role or whatever you are trying to do. In the French Revolution, and obviously not just there, but that's the pivotal point for us in Europe. Basically, we said that that's not true. Let, let, let the mind be free. Let us change ourselves. Whatever I did in the past doesn't necessarily define me. And this is a great, like a great idea that led to a lot of um, new developments, but also it still has itself this kind of core of Aristotelian thing that believing in things is more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. So obviously if I want to achieve something, I need to believe in it. Mm -hmm. But some people say that in order to achieve something, you only have to believe in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that is, I think, what drives the current day entertainment. And right. not just, but that, that's the, the idea behind it. If you look, even, not just entertainment, even, even newspapers and everything else, almost everywhere you can see this. And, and I do mean everywhere, like um, scientists and like serious people who pride themselves on their thinking still usually uh, unknowingly subscribe to this kind of thinking that the primacy of the thought, mm -hmm. which goes against my cyclical thing where I believe that thoughts are driven by common thinking and the individual action and the individual talk can only in, uh, indirectly influence like, All right. uh, our common thinking. So that's my kind of analysis, how we got here. So that's where I mm -hmm. kind of disagree with you because I don't, I don't believe that this is a very new phenomenon. It's just, okay, and let, that's one last point. Um, a lot of people look around in, in today's world and say that um, how, how much more lies there are than before like how, mm -hmm. how little truth in it. And I think in absolute terms, actually, um, you said something similar in the beginning, like um, the strife for excellence or something like that, that uh, mm -hmm. before 100 years ago, there was this uh, driving people towards excellence. And nowadays it, it is replaced by this um, attention craving, like influencer kind of behavior. And what right. I want to say is that that's true that, in, uh, that maybe in a ratio there is much more, but that's mostly because 
we are mu- like there are much more people on earth and the rate of communication is much higher mm-hmm. so the ratio is also higher in this respect but in absolute terms like i'm not sure how much youtube you watch but there are thousands of people who do like gene editing or just diy projects that like building electron microscopes and stuff stuff like it it wasn't really there before like people haven't had the skills or the materials or the resources like there are much more leonardo da vinci's today than in his time Mm -hmm. okay so yeah, um, there, there are still a couple of those that I couldn't express, but uh, I should uh, let you also react to this. Yeah, cool. I, well, there's nothing in there that I, I uh, outstandingly disagree with. I, I probably agree with all of it. Um, it's just like more context to, I think, what I was saying. And so like what is this, one of the initial thoughts that I had was in terms of how, why writing became so prolific, uh, as a medium is because before the only competition writing had in terms of the ability for dead people to talk verbatim to living people was painting and painting only expresses uh, so much. Um, you need a lot like, you know, sure. A, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, but then again, people's development of their ability to paint also evolved in stages like the art uh, transformations it's actually incredibly hard to paint realistically <laughs> so people painted uh, symbolically well, but uh, it depends if you want to paint something that already is there um, the, yep. the camera thing where they use the dark room and right. like that that they did hundreds of years ago already right so yeah, like for example, I'm talking like 50,000 years ago, like when, <laughs> when we're now bringing in writing, this is what I mean. Like you had uh, cave paintings or you had hieroglyphics and things like that. Right. Like this was the competition to writing, but writing allowed you to then really actually communicate philosophy beyond uh, verbal stories. And so the, another one that I, I recognized was, yeah, propaganda. You know, more recently it's been, uh, gov- well, most recently it's companies. Uh, before that, it was governments, but even before that, uh, it was very much uh, religions. Uh, religions were the, you know, propaganda and, and sustenance of a community and of the values of that community. And then, as nations grew beyond, uh, as the nation state kind of created, you had that embedding of religion with the nation state. And then eventually, the nation state superseded the religion um, in terms of how many people, you know, is within its wing. Um, so I think those are, uh, two thoughts there, but yeah, everything else you said, I, I, I don't think I, I disagree with any of it. Okay. So where do we go from here? And right. like, uh, again, I could talk very long, but I would rather just yeah. <laughs> shorten it down. Um, there is certainly, uh, like a really interest, like it's not there wasn't really a, a, a formulated question there but there was like a a way of looking at things that i think could be elaborated on um it was it was something in what you said so you can say your other points and then we can try and hone in on what that was uh yeah well, i'm not sure i could go back and uh, not uh, ramble too much uh, I'm yeah. a bit, bit early in the morning for me. <laughs> I, I stayed up to 3, 3 a.m. So okay. not the best idea. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what's my realization is, is that there is some truth in writing. So it's, mm-hmm. it actually, okay, so the one, one point before even that is the oh, yeah. so it is the, the, so I think what the question was uh, is how much of our deliberation is our own control and how much is nurture or the environment's control? Is that one of the questions we're wrestling with? Um, 
or like our agency, if we just use the word agency, how much of our agency is our own control versus the environment's control? Yeah, so I, I think that a lot of things people like to blame on each other is not actually uh, meaningful to blame on each other. It's just very easy. On the other hand, I don't see, uh, going back to what you said about adults acting like children, I don't see um, a lot of people actually realizing how much they could do if they would like be conscious about these things. Right. And a, a lot of arguments that I had with people about these topics is that it's very hard to it's very hard to convince people that it's um, it it's worth trying to build um, tools like mostly software tools, but I use it in a more general way that hel help us navigate in this to, to be able to discern, okay, this information I need to, I need to like, I, it's okay if I trust it or if, if uh, I like, I would like to trust it, but I would like to look it up. And this is what I lack that although there is a lot of talk, uh, most of it is impossible to validate in any way. Right. And I, th I think that it's not as impossible as um, the prominent intellectuals say it is to actually build tools that allow uh, validation of truths. So basically, my idea is to that okay, so with the internet, journalism, at least the old kind of journalism, was killed. Um, even before that, basically, that there is a, um, um, there is discussion about this: how investigative journalism was not profitable because basically uh, companies were suing um, newspapers, and it, it wasn't profitable for them. So it rather they went. And even even recently, when we know that uh, Facebook cheated with the video advertisement numbers for years. And a lot of newspapers uh, moved to video media. And yeah. like ba basically we lost a lot of good people who who've wrote uh, quality journalism because right. nobody's supporting them. Mm -hmm. So although there is a lot of need to be able to do this, and there isn't much how to do it. And what we used before, that's like going to libraries and looking stuff up and basically just discussing it with people. It's not fast enough. It, it, it works, but by the time we make up our mind, everybody just moved on. Right. Like there is a new thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I can speak a bit uh, about this. So there was... Uh, as part of the Beverly Study Group, we read uh, Beyond Good and Evil by Nietzsche. And the first half of it is really interesting. Nietzsche kind of presents, how do you know what is true when you can't even know you're thinking your own thoughts? Like, how do you prove the thoughts you have are actually yours? And so that's kind of like the birth of postmodernism with uh, that half of the book. But then the second half of the book is like, look, we're still humans who are forced to act in this world. So how do we know what to act? And the way we act is by knowing ourselves and knowing our nature. And by knowing that, then we can solve the problem. Like the problem of the first kind of goes away because we can accept them with humility and skepticism about any truth. But at the same time, we can build a resilience of what is practically useful in our lives. Um, uh, but, you know, you still have the, the issue of, okay, well, how do I come to know myself and, and what shall I focus on? Um, but it, just in terms of that, it's interesting because then you have like the, the Stalinists who took the first half and then, you know, thought, hey, we can change anything with nurture. And then even we can gra change one grain, like one seed to a different type of grain through nurture. Uh, and this was very problematic. And then you had... So, I think it was more like Leninism that was it rather than Stalinism.
But then you also, on the other half, the know the know thy nature. You also had well the Nazi Germany situation, which was well, the Jews have a specific culture. So if we want to detach the cult, like we've tried several times to detach the culture from the genes. So maybe we just need to focus on the genes aspect. So we should ask them, evict them because of their role in our economy becoming superior in our economy. So we should ask for them evict, and if they don't, we're going to kill them. Um, so you have you know, issues where they, if they used both sides of this, uh, then it would have had been a lot better results for those two parties. Um, but in, in regards to the uh, individual, I, it's, it's kind of uh, tricky because I, I'm not sure, like at least for myself, like I have enough traumatic experiences that you start to realize, yeah, it kind of sucks being hurt in the real life, like in the flesh, uh, maybe instead I should play out characters in my mind abstractly against different scenarios to kill them and learn from them first. Um, so that's part of the role of debate and, and conversation or, or the importance of speech, because if we can allow uh, disparate parties to then argue with each other, then hopefully they kill each other in argument rather than actually by hands. Um, and that way they can uh, be reborn uh, without actually losing the, like, like the bodies. Um, and so I think that's part of it. And, and to some extent, some of the, uh, there has been a focus on that. There were, I think that tied into something else you said about um, the, the, no, it wasn't the collective heartbeat. Um, I can't remember. I, I'll get your thoughts on, on what I just said. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I was expecting you to finish it. <laughs> okay, so, right. okay, so I'm not very into the early early 20th century history because I have my suspicions that we don't have a clear picture. So I don't like to to go there too much because I, I just assume that I make too many mistakes uh, in, in my assumptions. Right. Yeah. Um, so for example, the Jews were used for hundreds of years uh, the same way um, that they were not let to, that they weren't uh, allowed to do anything else but uh, stuff around money and then regularly they were blamed and dropped by the same people who allowed them to thrive in the first place. Uh, it was yeah. so much a repeating pattern that at some point people who haven't had uh, Jew um, communities made up uh, from other people such similar communities and call them our Jews, even though they were not actually mm -hmm. Jews and right. use the same way. So they allowed them to enrich themselves with uh, uh, suspicious uh, methods and then basically just took uh, the money from them. Right. So it's, it's a very, very old pattern that repeats mm -hmm. also. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I was going to yep. say, yeah, obviously I was uh, oversimplifying. <laughs> okay. Uh, like, okay. you know, simplifying for the point of uh, 30 seconds or so. It's oh, I see. really, really tricky. Yeah. Yeah, it's very hard. So, like, that, that's why I want to steer away from them because these have so much right. baggage that it's like. Uh... Yeah, what would actually, so this, this is an important point. Uh, and I think you brought it up earlier, which is that um, just to articulate in the way that I would is it, it's not that, yeah, so the point that you raised was something like a criticism of the idea that there's more lies today. Uh, and then followed on by, well, there's actually a lot of Leonardo da Vinci's today, but earlier was rarer because of the lack of widespread education and ability uh, and resources. And that's, that's uh, you know, people can nitpick about that, but I'm not going to, because uh, in general we can run with it. And uh, so, shit, what was, what was the point? Um, Shit, what did I just say? Because it's late for me as well. <laughs> it's early for you and it's late for me. Um, 
shit, what, what was the earlier point? Oh, the lies and the truth thing. Oh, yeah. So what the biggest thing that I see uh, right now is a lack of the ability to think critically. And obviously, critical thinking is not it is incredibly new. Like in terms of psycho technologies deployed throughout the human race, it is unbelievably new, like maybe 200 years old. Uh, the ability to um, uh, what, uh, sorry, so I, what I, I get it. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna. I'll qualify it. So, yeah. so obviously we had Aristotelian thinking, right? But with Aristotle, it was still like if you can argue it. Oh, sorry, with Socrates, if you can argue it, uh, then we would assume it to be true. And this continued on to until Kant, and when he did the critique of pure reason, he was like, wait, we we can't just argue things. So, for instance, uh. Uh, we also have to prove them. So, and this was evidenced by Descartes. Descartes, uh, he was, there was a situation where he was around, so he's kind of labeled as one of the first scientists or the first modern scientists. And what happened was he, they were arguing about what causes a heartbeat. And they were reasoning that, hey, well, it's because the, the blood works like a kettle and it heats up and then that causes pressure to make it go. And then he was just like, wait, but it's not actually that hot. It must be something else. So he would cut up tons of things and try and prove what was actually being reasoned. Uh, and this is a big difference between uh, like this, this birth of objectivity. And it's not just like, so when we talk about the Aristotelian idea, that can still be subjective, which is like a subjective thing of, I can put things in the right place to me and then project that into the world. But there was only really until uh, Descartes and Kant that they were like hey there's actually an objective reality separate from our own self that we need to measure and prove and test against uh, and that's what I mean by this the idea of like the scientific method of saying okay let's create a hypothesis with constraints on its validity and then we can try and test it to see if it's real or not real see if it's false and if we can't falsify it then this isn't something we can prove and we care about things we can actually prove um, so things that we can't necessarily prove are then still more or less in the realm of philosophy. And these are, to a lot of extent, most people are operating on axioms that they've never proved. They just assume to be true. Um, and this, and these type of assumptions of things we assume to be true that are axioms, you'll see this, uh, operate in cognitive dissonance. Like if you're arguing God with a theist or you're arguing God with a atheist, <laughs> Either way, at some point, for most people, they're going to reach a point where they'll say something like, well, the thing is, or, uh, or it's just this way, or some type of uh, phrase uh, that, um, or that, because they're being confronted with something that is new to them, it's creating this state of cognitive dissonance, and then they have to reinforce the axiom that they're now clamping onto. Now, for most people, uh, like I, I use the phrase of like our axiom, like we're always kind of holding onto a cliff's edge and the cliff's edge is the axiom that we're believing. And at some point, someone may realize that, uh, you know, so when someone's axiom is being challenged, they're, they're looking down and thinking, oh shit, I'm going to fall. I'm going to die because my axiom is threat and I have nothing to hold onto. My reality is collapsing. I'm falling into the matrix. Um, but for a lot of people, they can't see as abstractly or as far as, as people with higher intelligence. And that's just, just you know, whatever. But the, the thing is, is for a lot, and even intelligent people will do this, but it's important to realize, like, maybe you're falling and you're grasping onto this axiom. But that axiom, that cliff's edge is also falling, like the whole cliff is collapsing. Because most people they'll start falling and then they'll grab onto a rock and then they'll be like, I'm safe now. Everything's okay. I have my rock, but they don't realize the rock is also falling with them. So part of this quest for objectivity and this quest of truth at the sacrifice of your own ideals um, and your own self is this idea of, I want to make sure my cliff's edge that I am holding onto is actually attached to something real and that I, it's not falling with me. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. So uh, Descartes for me, um, well, I, I first started seriously thinking about Descartes after I heard Chomsky explain 
uh, why the mind-body problem doesn't exist. Because Descartes was the, the, the person who basically, well, even before him, but we know the mind-body problem uh, from him. And Chomsky made the point that since Newton, we know that this problem doesn't exist. So Descartes had, um, had to reconcile the religious thinking with the new mechanistic thinking that was ongoing in this kind of early scientific revolution. And Newton, after deducing the, basically the law of gravity or whatever we call it, had to realize that there is a kind of action at distance and whatever is driving our world is not, not a kind of mechanistic power, but mm -hmm. it's something immaterial, what we call fields nowadays. Mm -hmm. So since Chomsky, I, I, just, I just agree that the Descartes' idea of, well, basically, I'm not, I'm not sure if you know or if I know it correctly, because obviously I didn't read Descartes, I just uh, listened to others, that uh, Descartes' argument in the end was that, like, he was asked that, okay, if, uh, if there is a separate mind and body, then how does the mind affect the body? And Descartes' mm -hmm. solution to this was that God, God listens to the mind and acts it creates the reality of action. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that that's that makes a lot of sense because there's a book called uh, "Think and Grow Rich" that was commissioned by Andrew Carnegie. Napoleon Hill wrote it, and Andrew Carnegie, uh, he was the richest man that ever lived. He built the American steel industry, and when he was being interviewed by Napoleon Hill when Napoleon Hill was a teenager, and then he was like, "Okay, I, I I'll have a life's." purpose for you you can interview all the most successful people and make that your life's work to find out what's different between the successful people and the unsuccessful people and that book was kind of the result of that and part of it uh was they so this is also where like the secret kind of bastardized the original stuff but they talk about it and there's like a oh, framework and each there's maybe 17 chapters and they go into a lot on on different things but the most important thing kind of came out of it was uh, this idea of agency or the ability to to control one's own mind. Um, and and I, I read this book when I was like a teenager and, and about five years ago, or, yeah, only five years ago, I actually had the thought for the first time in my life, like, hey, I have a mind. This is probably the greatest tool I have. Maybe I should learn how to use it, right? And like, it's baffling that that took me 25 years to, to ask that question. Uh, like, well, even, so. even a couple of months ago, I had friends telling me that it's um, uncanny or something like that, a similar word, that I put such a big emphasis on cognitive dissonance. Like I say that it's not a good idea. And uh, since then I realized why I do this because it's absolutely true. I, I believe that it's a process, like I, I believe in process-oriented thinking instead of object-oriented thinking. Um, basically the Aristotelian, everything has its place, is the object-oriented thinking that every object has its properties and even people have their properties, uh, better put innate abilities or something like that. Yeah. Or you are born this way, talents and similar stuff. Like exactly, actually I, I went to art school for a while and all my best teachers said that it's 1% talent, 99% uh, work experience. Right. So that was also a defining moment for me to realize that the best artists I ever knew all said that, well, you actually don't need that much talent. <laughs> you just need right. to practice, practice, practice. And um, yeah, so I, I realized that, and I wanted to say this before, how our brain works, it's not just the neuro, okay, I don't know the exact word, but it's not just in the biology how it works, but how the processes work. And I, I don't really have too much information to go about, but I, I can see what is useful. And 
it's a great example that people often use that on the savanna when something is running towards you it's not very useful to start to categorize okay how many legs it have what kind of fur it has does it have right. big teeth and big claws your brain just takes a lot of information and reduces it to such a minuscule information like it, it hides most of it and this is what made me realize that our brain doesn't find truths it finds use so takes a lot of truths and drops most of them off and just uses like it takes what what it finds useful and for a long time this didn't have any kind of like it was more beneficial than bad but since mm -hmm. there are so many people and it's more important how you think and how you communicate and how you interact with people then actually how useful your thinking is in the real world because you are cushioned by the society and the infrastructure and civilization from the real world to a big part it's the these useful things become like corrupted like something mm -hmm. that is very good on the savanna when you need to survive it becomes something like not beneficial to put it mildly right so going back to cognitive dissonance the useful thing is that in every place where i go i i know what can happen there and i behave the uh, properly to that environment so actually cognitive dissonance in the beginning was probably incredibly useful but now that we want to actually uh, be able to discern truths that are like bigger truths that are uh, true in in a way that a society can organize itself based on it and not not be afraid like there are a lot of things that we can use to organize society but eventually if we don't change them it usually becomes corrupted even if it's in the beginning it's good um, we build an institution over it and that becomes self-serving and at some point the truths are not there to be useful but they are there to be maintained like that's the ritual part and just doing the same right. thing over and over again because we always had so it's very useful now to be able to have a, a kind of thinking that doesn't require you changing it every time you get into a new situation so to be able to reduce the cognitive dissonance and like, like and the, the reason is because it allows a, a more holistic way of thinking so instead of getting some interaction like if if i trust you or like if if i'm in an environment where i trust people and they say something that i don't like it's not as hard to think about and maybe react it in a in a good way but if i'm talking with someone who i don't trust and they say something that is critical or even just challenging it's much easier to pick a superficial reaction um that can be applied to that situation or like mm -hmm. you are like this or you are, you are a leftist or you are a rightist or you feel like you are stupid or anything like it's much right. easier to do that than actually take consideration where the other person is coming from so that's why i believe that cognitive dissonance need to be reduced because otherwise we are not being to, we are not going to be able to go to these uh, like more general ways to organize society right yeah well fair enough i mean like i i i had a series of i i, I don't know an extended breakdown around like 2014 and 15 uh and in that like i really i'm not sure if it was then but it's certainly i i've been aware of cognitive distance for a very long time and um yeah i've always felt the need to rectify that and i mean Either way, like people will experience cognitive dissonance in the life, whether or not they like it or not, they will be challenged. And, you know, so if we consider cognitive dissonance as the distance between your ideal self, your actual self and your uh, should self, right? You want all of them to be together. So you're cohesive and uniform and, and also that way you can be authentic. But 
you know, these things arise all the time. And most people, like you have an aspirational goal, you have this ideal, but your family doesn't want you to do it. That's the should self. And then you have your real self and maybe you don't have the ability. And, you know, do you kill that ideal or do you change your environment to then chase it? Uh, and, and, or it's like, you know, your should self, like, you know, if your should self is all the way out there, but your ideal and your actual is there, you need to redefine your morality or you need to change your behaviors again to align with your moral or your actual self. Like if your actual self is the one that is distant from your ideal and your should, you know, are you really an asshole and a bastard or, you know, are everyone else wrong and they're trying to oppress you using shame? So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really tricky like like and especially if, you know in relationships like they always test you um especially just with the different trials like it's hard to integrate with other people they they have different experiences they have different lives so we need this ability to transcend through dissonance like by resolving dissonance so that way we can actually get along with other people beyond superficial uh yeah be, beyond superficial interactions and so to the last point uh have you heard about marshall rosenberg a guy who wrote the book no. nonviolent communications it's incredible well, i've good. heard of the book yeah it's incredibly I, I, good I read it or anything. well uh, you mentioned the relationships and like other people and my my girlfriend uh gave me this book and okay. it got like it validated so much what i was believing before like right. I, it, it really like it's so nice to be able to even like even when you when you already think that you know a lot, and somebody right. just give you a book that probably twenty years ago, twenty years ago, ten years ago, I would have just not even understood, and now right. I was sitting there and listening to this. Oh my God, this actually works. Anyway, so that is I think a, a very good uh, example of how we can we can actually do this properly like to 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 be able to talk to each other in a way that's like it's simplistic and it's not good for our situation it requires a lot of like there are a lot of assumptions like all participants need to actually want to uh, agree and not kill each other but right. it works it definitely works um so why going... so one of the questions there is actually if you allow me to interject is um whether or not how we how we can get people to want to because because one of the things is it's like uh because we need so for people so this is like the whole safe spacing like what a safe space should be is a place where people can feel comfortable in that environment to grow and not just a place where people are comfortable where they feel reinforced but a place where they can expose their vulnerabilities without exploitation of those vulnerabilities um, and this is in part what virtue signaling does, like conservatives virtue signal, uh, uh, leftist virtue signal, everyone uh, does it to an extent by, there's a few little phrases that people will use or the way that they dress even, mm -hmm. uh, the, the tones or the language or whatever. There's all these different signals that people are emitting to then say, hey, you can trust me, I'm on your team, we're part of the same group, or we're against each other and I, I don't like you and we're not going to get along. Yeah. Um, so like a lot of part of uh, agreeable personality traits is about doing these signals to say, Hey, we can all get along, but then disagreeable people can generally do the same signals to say like, no, I don't get along with these ideas. This is not right. Um, but there's, and, and so th there's a challenge there to, uh, get opposing groups to get along and to go back to one of the other things you mentioned about the usefulness, like we see things that are useful. Um, there's also a part of it is we see things that are meaningful uh, to us. So for instance, like a lion that's about our eat or a snake, that is incredibly meaningful to us right now. But our values are also defining what is meaningful or what is useful. And people will have different values, uh, some be it nurture, some be it nature. Um, and so people are finding different things useful, or valuable and meaningful to themselves. And to understand that without using a superiority ability to be like, Hey, 
everyone should think like me is a is a challenge for a lot of people uh so oh because otherwise you can be like hey my way is the best way everyone should just be like me um and a lot of people do that and it, it's hard because as your way could actually be only true in the environment you grew up and it may actually be incredibly damaging for other people yeah this this goes back to hanging on to the rocks while falling off the cliff uh, right. Uh, I actually had this this uh, analogy of the life too of we are all falling and the, all we can do is just avoid the collisions between each other. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure if you know about the project that Whitehead and um, oh, I keep forgetting his name, Russell. He's the one of the my favorite. Uh, people of, of like uh, all time and I keep forgetting his name uh, basically they wrote like they they try to write this book that derives types from logic uh, okay. like they, they have like um, I think it's called Principia Mathematica or something like that or maybe that's Newton's let me let me google it because I'm annoyed <laughs> all right. Russell Whitehead yeah, Principia Mathematica. And so they, they try to derive all, like use logic and derive from that all these mathematical truths. And then came Gödel and basically used their type theory and shown that despite all the logical correctness and everything that's nice about it, he could still use the, those rules and just those rules that they wrote down and introduce but basically two things that he, he proved. One is that he can introduce um, um, statements in that language, which were clearly paradoxical. So self um, conflicting, like, st like the, the obvious example, I think something similar that he used is that the line before this line is uh, false. The line before, uh, line uh, after this line is true, or something like that. So, like basically, like uh, that. Um, like there, there are a bunch of logical, um, like even older logical, like paradoxical constructions where the like you say things in in this uh, self-conflicting matter. And the other thing that he shown that there are true statements that are unprovable. So you, you, can, right. you can know that it's true because of other ways, but there is no way to prove them. And ever right. since Gödel, especially mathematicians, but using Gödel, all other scientists basically just gave up. Like I, that's, mm -hmm. I cannot describe it any other way. They say that, okay, we cannot write true things. Mm -hmm. Like there is no reason to, tie, to try and okay, software people can use the type theory to validate their own stuff, but that's just, that's just software. And well, I, I, I personally don't like types in software anyway, and that's, that's an even longer story. But my point is that this, this kind of thinking that it's not worth trying to get at absolute truths because there are no absolute truths. Since Gödel is like so pervasive, so basic, that people, like, it's, it's not that people don't want to, to find truths and know what it's worth to believe in. It's just that whoever tries it and got, gets this far, gets to Gödel and understands the whole point of his uh, writing says that okay it's not worth trying to go further and actually all we can do is just create safe spaces and make sure that the ideas that we think we believe in is like they are maintained and overall we will see like basically a kind of voting system where like like indirect voting system that whoever's ideas will win, we assume that those must be the best ideas instead of actually trying to validate those ideas. Right. Yeah. So, 
yeah, th this is where I, uh, I want to do something different. This is where I want to do something practical. I believe that it's like, it's, it's like I can say it in a couple of words. We already know that we can write things down and hash them, like create a hash that says that, okay, at this time I said this and I, if I give you the hash now, later I can prove that yes, I had that like between reasonable limits. I can prove that yes, I, I wrote down this statement or I had this picture at this time because at that time I already had a hash of that picture. Mm -hmm. And like putting together this cryptographic stuff, like I, I was into a blockchain stuff for a while. You can create a kind of information network where individuals don't have to reveal themselves, but can share statements. And then other people can say that, okay, I believe in this, or I don't believe in this. Who said it first? Like just track the flow of information because that's what, what I think is missing today is, right. is to be able to track where an idea comes from. And right. because it's a shouting match and basically right. whoever can say things louder can say the true things. Right. It's, yeah, it's so, so I was thinking, so, so there's two ways we can follow this up. So the, the one way is uh, that I, I'll mention, which is memes and the epidemiology of memes. Uh, this is Richard, Richard Dawkins meme. But the other one is going back to the tweet thread is this entertainment thing and how I said like, you know, virtue signaling groups provide safety for its members. Uh, again, so one of the things is I think this is what entertainment is doing which is saying that we can continue to give you propaganda to re like to to maintain the scaffolding of your belief system so you can continue to feel comfortable without it being threatened like it's it's kind of like you know continue looking here so you don't have to look look uh you know outside where everything's falling apart and and to some extent companies do this like companies do this through their employees where the managers could be aware of something existent like some crisis of the company but they still have to put on the brave face and then be like look guys or girls or whatever to we have to be able to get this stuff done we can do it we're a team and everything like that like to to some extent we need to constrain the available information to unionize people towards a mutualistic beneficial goal. Uh, but then to some extent, some people uh, will be able to take on the challenge of these meta battles, um, these high level battles. And you know, to some extent, this is the difference between a soldier and a general or the difference between a worker and a CEO or the difference between a, uh, you know, a, what is it? A, uh, a person of a nation and then the politician, right? Like we're appointing different people of expertise to take on meta battles so we can operate with utility, uh, with the constraints that we have on our attention or our aptitudes. Now, for the other part, this epidemiology of memes, I think this is something that Richard Dawkins' work of a meme, which is uh, the battle landscape of genes has gone so far and it's also going but now with the programmability of minds, we're also seeing the exact same behavior as genes and minds, which is these ideas, uh, you know, be an idea, uh, self-transcendence, or be an idea, uh, 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 racism, or be an idea, uh, uh, brushing your teeth, right? So these different things, these will infect uh, an at-risk population they will spread depending on how successful they are at maintaining the host or killing competition. And they will hopefully propagate uh, vertically through generations or horizontally through other people. Um, so right now we have some very successful ideas uh, that are operating in the world. And some of those big battles would be like, communi like the, the big battle of the Cold War is like communism versus capitalism. Right, so this is a battle of two memes fighting it out uh, in, the, in the host environment of people's brains. And 
what I think would be really cool that data science can really do is start actually tracking not just the spread of a YouTube video, but actually the spread of ideas and how many minds have been affected with an idea. What is its susceptibility, like its infection rate? You know, how often does it spread to other people? Yeah, um, my, like what I would like from these two is are much less data science and much more uh, like a, a search index. I would like to be able to find similar ideas. I would like to know what people believe in, in the sense that, or, or rather I would like people to know what they believe in. Like I would like to be able to show them that look, these three things that you believe in are actually in conflict with each other. Like you are using uh, double standards without knowing it, which is a other way right. to say cognitive dissonance, right? Right. So without being able to sh to connect these um, separate compartments of of thoughts in people's mind, I I, I don't think that they could like join join up different goals of theirs. Because that's right. that's really the problem. What is your goal, and what are trying what you are trying to maintain? And as you said, in in entertainment, that this this signaling, like, uh, a thought I had before is that because we are, uh, as a global community, we are uh, paying attention on the same things. This means that even if we disagree with what we see it still affects our thinking. So uh, a, a good way to describe this is uh, how politicians lie. Politicians don't lie by actually lying. The biggest lie is usually is, is the contextualizing, is the, is the spinning of things that instead of talking about something important, we have to talk about something silly they said, like Trump does this all the time when he's, he wants to divert attention. Instead of trying to make up something, just say something stupid and people go off for a week and like what he did right now. It's like, obviously it's not something it's worth paying attention, but because he is such a prominent member of our society, Everybody does, and as long as we pay attention to what stupid thing he said, even though he agrees with us that it was a stupid thing, we spent two or three right. days wasting our right. time. Well, I mean, like a lot of that is validation, like people are seeking validation, and that validation can come through do you believe the same things as me? But the validation can also be like, Am I pretty? Am I handsome? Do people, you know, what is my social posturing? Uh, so there's social posturing in terms of like your physique, your behaviors, but also in terms of what you believe. And a lot of that, like high school gossip or like high school, it's vicious. It, 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 you know, it's formulating groups about people's physique, their aperture's, their abilities, what they think. And like that's gossip, like gossip is this arena battling for conformance over we're sharing the same thoughts. Mm. And I think like Instagram has absolutely infiltrated uh, so uh, like, like a lot of the world or TikTok, things like these, like these early plat like information platforms, the distribution platforms for kids, because they like kids, the most meaningful thing to them is being top of the little social hierarchy. Um, and these, uh, that those platforms really hook into that system and it's just high school completely magnified but even when you go to youtube today like anytime i go to the trending tab or even like the twitter's trending tab like any of these trending tabs anywhere most of it is just posturing it's just like he said this she said that you know we should think this um and it's uh like it's it's interesting because to some extent i think like a celebrity is someone who warps the matrix around them. Like, you know, when Neo stops the bullets in the first matrix, so they are someone who defines their environment. Their presence now shapes the environment that they are in. When most people, they mold to the environment. And a celebrity does the opposite. And I think that's why we idolize celebrities to an extent. But it's also, I think, a projection on people for them to have the wish to be, have that. Like, it's, it's a projection of, I wish to have that ability. I wish I aspire to mold myself in the way that that celebrity molds themselves with ease. 
And there is, I think, this hope for this transcendence there, except for so many people, they haven't been able to master the art yet of being the change that they wish to see. Uh, yeah. And and that's often because they're afraid and terrified. Like, it's not safe for them to do so. Like, so, for instance, I spent, uh, I lived two years, actually, in Malaysia. And in Malaysia, no one, I like, you know, there would be an issue with something. I would return an order or, you know, with apartment rentals, I would complain about something like, you know, maybe the jacuzzi isn't working. I'll be like, hey, when is the jacuzzi going to be fixed? And I'll be like, I don't know. And I'll be like, it's your job to know, like, what's going on, right? And, or like, you know, so whatever it is, and, and what I end up realizing is, is, you know, I asked my Malaysian friends and they are like, we are, uh, we are scared, timid people who do not complain. <laughs> and, and then I realized like, like they're an occupied country. They, well, you know, they claimed their independence, uh, you know, in the last century, but previously they were an occupied country. Uh, and if you're an occupied country, you learn to shut up and do what you're told. And that embeds itself into the morality. You don't ask why you don't question things because it's not safe to do so. It harms you and it, eliminates you from the gene pool like a successful strategy or the meme pool right like like these are dangerous things but so the people who actually survive questioning stuff like you know for every uh mel gibson and braveheart there's many who got slaughtered on the first attempt right yeah so. well i come from an occupied country like uh, i'm hungarian right. from transylvania which is in romania so okay. and that that part was actually it was multicultural even before that so before that was occupied by the hungarians and the romanians were and other uh, nations were uh, in the same situation but yeah i can i can completely um agree with that that um uh, that uh, small Hungarian community in in those mine, mountains uh, does have this uh, this attitude that you have to respect tradition even more than otherwise. Like that area of of uh, the globe is already a bit like traditionalist, and but uh, we, I mean my uh, compatriots, how should I say, uh, are even more so because like. The religion is different. The language is very different, and um, yeah, that's how people survived this long. That they they try to be the same as their ancestors, right? And yeah. that that also means not questioning them, not questioning anything, right? Well, even even today, I think like you know that's still a very successful strategy because there's many things like. Say, for instance, welfare, or it could, like, equal rights is new, right? And for us to, to say that, you know, it, and it's been a march for a very long time, like liberty and equality. This has been a march for an incredibly long time. But do we actually know it's going to perform better? And this is not something we measure within 100 years. This is something we measure over a 1,000 years kind of thing. Like, like well, so, some aspects are quite clear, like... Um, um, right like birth rates and the just uh, overall yeah. health is very, very yeah. obvious where women are given chances. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this, and like, I mean, these are things we're learning. We're learning like what happens when you educate women and we're learning uh, these things. And, and, you know, it, like it depends as well on like what we're actually optimizing for. So for instance, like many foods, they're good for us and bad for us are many things we consume, but it depends what we're actually optimizing for. Right, like, like, you know, if I'm optimizing to get buff as quickly as possible, I could probably take steroids or whatever else, right? But then it'll cause certain side effects. So like, is it good for me? Well, it depends how I'm measuring good. Is it bad for me? It depends, right? So it's, it's always like for this truth thing, we've got to qualify it into a specific constraint where it's true and what its side effects are. And, you know, for a lot of these major axioms that society is battling with, these are questions that we're still wrestling with the validity validity of we've got a practice and now people competing in the hope that the axiom that they've selected is actually going to be true uh, in the long run and it's going to be interesting like say you know there could very well be a case where uh you know another like people like to think like another world war won't happen but then there could always be like a way worse coronavirus that then for some reason just attacks people with a certain blood type like coronavirus prefers people like has more severe effects with people with type a blood 
So there's things like this where it's like, you know, if that was worse, then evolutionary drift could happen, whereas just some freak accident just wiped out a successful gene population um, or a meme completely out. And, and these, I, I mean, it's going to be really interesting because it's the same thing like the personality trait openness. We have uh, like the different personality distributions of different groups uh, have been that way because they have been successful. So for instance, with why we have people who are high on openness and low on openness is a, a, uh, a, a what is it, contrived example is um, when there's a scarcity of food, people high on openness will be more likely to experiment um, and they may find new food sources, but they may also poison themselves more, like, more likely. So, but the conservatives who then don't uh, are then the people on openness, then they are they going to sustain themselves if everybody dies by going out and eating all the bad stuff. So it's the same thing for an expedition. Like if you send off everyone on an expedition, you need some people to stay behind because <laughs> in case all the expeditions fail. So we have a, a lot of interesting things like be a drift or actually being an adaption um, that can really affect us. And, and but so to tie it back, I, th there seems to be a need for humility, like this need to constrain one's projections uh, and also this need to feel safe with exposing one's vulnerability, where even if they were exploited, one has faith in the wisdom they've acquired to be able to deal with the exploitation. And that's something which uh, it is a real struggle with. And, and this is part of maturation, like Eleanor Roosevelt, and a lot of people, like I started studying this last year where I was like, okay, let's find on archive.org all the old texts of maturity. And it was a real focus point to creating people who could deal with, uh, with conflict. It, like that was a major part of maturation was getting you where you could deal with conflict. And uh, yeah, so I think this is a, an issue where we now need not just entertainment to protect our comforts, but we also need... Uh, things that release dopamine that also make us feel safe in, in transcending. Yeah, I think that the, really the, the, the solution would be something that goes against this axiomatic thinking. Like, uh, that, that, like this is a yin-yang situation, I believe, that um, yeah, uh, some ideas are so basic that I might not even realize that I believe in them. I just use them by default. On the other hand, when I'm trying to communicate these ideas, there is a way to go about it that doesn't require um, or not require too much of, of this shared axiomatics. Like this, this is where like, it, it, it really, I call it a 50,000 year old mistake because we say that language is about 50,000 year old. And <clears throat> I, be, I believe that we haven't really faced up to, to this m mistake of, of uh, how our brain works. And uh, we still like everywhere try to find the same truths in the objective reality or I like to call it shared reality because I'm not sure how objective right. is, but if it's shared, it's like, even if it's not true, at least it, right. there is some true in the communication. Right. And that, yeah, cause something that is uh, sh like universal and subjective may still not be objective. Yeah. This, this is like, uh, like John Searle uh, talks a lot about, all about this, how he had a lot of, problems with uh, neuroscientists who said that we cannot uh, study consciousness because consciousness is subjective and science is objective. And right. he's shown that this is just a bad pun because basically those are two different things. Like uh, just because something is, uh, well, let me use some big words here, uh, epistemologically uh, subjective doesn't mean that no, ontologically subject, it doesn't mean that we cannot say epistemologically uh, objective things about it. Like well, the good examples are like pain, 
pain is entirely subjective, but we still have painkillers that work universally. So that, and um, the other guy who, who really hit this home is uh, Marvin Minsky. Not sure if you know about him. So he, he well, he's one of the biggest AI promoters okay. like ever, like very influential. And he said that consciousness and similar words are just like, it's not a, not a single thing. We call consciousness a single thing because we don't really know what we are talking about. But it's actually probably hundreds of different processes that our brains maintain. And we just have this internal single flow of it. And we assume that then it must be a single thing. And this is what I'm trying to get at, that this axiomatic thinking, this objective-oriented thinking, um, like basically trying to find a single thing that is true when actually anything that is single or rather anything that is continuous, which basically means that it's a single thing that exists uh, through time mm -hmm. without changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are created by our minds. Those are not like they are part of our shared reality but they are not part of the physical reality. Mm -hmm. And this is right. where a lot of scientific uh, progress was made in the past century, where we realized that actually we need to take back the continuous thinking and start to think in, in chunks how, how things work. Right. So I, I think that we could expand that into, into talking about ideas. How, how continuous ideas are actually made up of expressions and like instances when people express them either directly or un indirectly. Right. Well, I mean, that, that sounds like that could be a good, good topic for another call. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, think we, I, I think we covered uh, these topics quite well. Um, at least for this one, and and I would love to have another call uh, as well. We we could look into that one. Uh, I'll, if you're okay with it, we'll upload this to the Beverage Channel, get some more eyes on it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I would and, like um, to hear ideas. Yeah, and uh, then from that we can. Uh, I'll forward you on to John, or I'll follow up uh, offline on how we can continue this because these are important questions. Um, okay. So. Just for those uh, those probing questions, let's uh, let's just go for what what we learned. So we've got how long has this been the case? So entertainment is a new modern warfare, and what criteria has this been the case? And which criteria does it emerge, sustain, and transform or end? Through history, when has this criteria emerged and shown or not shown this effect? So I think when entertainment is modern warfare, it's when a society then becomes comfortable where it's it's no longer in the necessity of scarcity uh it now has comforts so it can afford entertainment and then entertainment is then used as a it's either used as a transformative experience such as an opera or a tragedy or it's used and sometimes like it but actually maybe comedies are reinforcing and maybe tragedies are those that are transformed maybe, sure. both. We'll see. maybe yeah, both maybe yeah maybe both uh, well, a lot of the great ones are comedies and uh, like like uh, comedies and tragedies wrapped in one. Uh, yeah, so but like, yeah. stand-up comedians are uh, one right. of the biggest critics of our times. Right. Yeah. Well, this is I, I'd love to do a, another conversation, Stan, on like on comedy because one of the things I found is like I don't like when I watch a comedian, like I'm rarely laughing. Like most of the time they say, I'm just like, yeah, that's true. Like, sure. Like, okay, I get it. Like, like, and, but then like the people, they're like laughing, like they've never thought about this before. It's like, it's violating their preconceptions and it's surprising. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, and it, the same thing happens for me. Like, like often with my friends, I'll say something that I've thought about deeply and I'll laugh. And uh, it's always interesting. All right. So I've got another meeting uh, with Victor. Uh, so uh, we'll be ending this one and, and uh, I'll follow up with you offline now. Okay. Thank Bye. you. No worries. See ya. Nice to chat. Bye. Nice. Thank you. Bye.